Hello, Room of the Most High God. Welcome to another edition of the Kingdom Intelligence Briefing. KIB's purpose is to provide an intelligence briefing for the body of Messiah that will both inform and empower the remnant in the last days. We want you to know that you're not alone. There are more of us than you realize. And the ranks of the resistance against Mystery Babylon is growing every day. This is episode number 439. I'm your host, Dr. Michael Lake, and I'm in the KIB studio today with love of my life, Mary Lou. Well, good morning, everyone. Um, We've got some exciting news, I think, about some of the ways that God's telling the the directions he's given us to go. Uh, We're going to be working on switching our video or our audio podcast to video podcasts. We are. We've uh, we've been looking forward to starting this, and we're kind of researching, you know, all the equipment that we need to get and everything, and we're going to start getting it together and and rolling up our sleeves and getting to work. It's going to be the remodel over there in Seymour, and uh, really looking forward to it. And uh, we're planning not only to do uh, the Kingdom Intelligence Briefing video, but we're going to I'm going to go back and start doing weekly teachings and video. And uh, guys, just to be truthful, I tried to think so that we could be on TV where you had to do the, you know, the 30 minute and the 60 minute. That is not the way that I'm wired. And so uh, it's going to be much easier for me and a lot less stress if when God gives me something, I put it together and we're going to make sure that when we do this, we're also going to make the study notes available because I know that we have a lot of uh, people that use, uh, use these things in small group where they'll have the study notes that they can print out for everybody. It'll be free on, on the internet where they can download. So we're excited about this next move. We are. I think it's going to go well. And uh, we've got our, you know, God just downloading what we need to do during this time. I, I know it's a, well, God told me the other day, he said that, uh, let me get my note where I can say it just like he told me. He said, um, because these are extreme times, he has an extreme plan. And it's going to involve the reestablishment of the firm foundations um, because we've been doing some research and, and looking at different things. And, boy, I'm telling you, the more you look at, at what's gone on in the past, the more just uh, concerning it is to me because I, I think that we've got some rocky foundations that have been established, especially in the charismatic movement. And I think we need to, I asked Mike, I think you think you could go back and do some basic steps on just the basics of uh, just building the foundations. Well, and I think it's not just the charismatic Pentecostal, but even in, in the Baptist, we're seeing a lot of things because a lot of these um, things were actually came out of the Baptist church, like William Branham was uh, you know, in, in the Baptist church and was ordained Baptist, independent Baptist. And so in, I, I think one of the things that we need to do, the Bible says that we need to test everything. And part of it is going back and looking at where it came from historically. And I was, I was kind of appalled when we began researching some of this, how many things uh, that are commonplace in both the Baptist camp and the, and the Pentecostal camp that that came out of white supremacy. I mean, it just absolutely floored me, and I'm I'm doing more research on that and yeah, because some it's, different things. You can't just take what's on the internet. You oh, have no. to just do, and that's what Mike does best is he deep dives. And so we've and got to. I've got some books ordered, and I'm getting ready to do some deep diving from historians. But guys, it it, it has to go back. The enemy has constantly, and and, and I, there's there's this cosmic chess match going on. God is constantly trying to restore truth to the body to prepare us for the days ahead. <clears throat> the enemy is constantly trying to subvert that and enter in his own doctrines that really sound good. I mean, they, they may really sound good because they'll appease the flesh that uh, are, are not biblically sound when you really begin taking it apart and they begin, uh, and, and I, I have seen this historically over a lot of movements, they begin reading things into the text that are not there. And it is a reflection of maybe the cultural things that are going on at the time. And so you're, you're not exegeting Scripture, you're eisegeting Scripture, you're adding into Scripture uh, your own paradigms and everything based upon what's going on in your culture. And we need to realize the kingdom of God has its own culture. 
and every single one of us have been called out of the cultures of the world, and, and every culture that is not sanctified by the Word of God, Mary, is controlled by principalities, powers, and rulers of darkness. It is the world's system. Yeah, and we haven't been taught a lot about consecration. No, we've not. I mean, I look back at my life in younger years, even after um, I was baptized and then got baptized in the Holy Spirit, and I I didn't have any foundation. I I didn't learn the foundations. I didn't learn anything. I was just kind of out there floating, and, and look what happened. I mean, the enemy just took me and went to town. And so I would really like to see um, that established, that teaching established. So Because I, I do think we've seen people in the past that have true gifts, but then what it looks like is they— they get so far off doctrinally. Yes. And then and and then it almost discounts what they've done. I mean, that would make me question, I think anybody question, was that real? Uh, because how you know, and, and a lot of it I think what we're seeing, if it's if it's accurate, and you're gonna have to do lots of research, but it looks like to me that they got more into signs and wonders and things like that than the word. I yeah, mean, it well, looks some, like of, some of them had an evangelistic calling, where signs and wonders are a normal part of it. I mean, I mean, some of these guys, uh, and I, I don't mean this in a derogatory way, but they weren't educated. Okay, God called them right where they were, and you know, there there was a time like with with some that we could talk about. There was a time they had other men around them that were educated that kind of kept them online, and as long as they kept to their lane. Of, of being an evangelist, and they, they would have signs and wonders follow. But when they stepped out of that lane, they weren't prepared for it because they had no education to back it up. Mm-hmm. And so it's they would begin uh, befriending other people that were teaching some really crazy things and then accepting it as their own because they didn't have the uh, biblical background to be able to weigh what was being taught. It sounded good. Everybody liked it. Well, that's popular. That's what I'm going to teach, which I think is really going on a lot in the body of Christ today. Uh, I I have seen so many ministries. Well, if this ministry over here built a 10,000 member congregation by teaching these things, I'll just get their books and I'll teach the exact same thing that they're teaching. Uh, I remember uh, Judson Cornwell and uh, guys, if you can find his book on the four portraits of a leader, get the book it is uh, it is wonderful but even in his day and he wrote this i think back in the 70s or 80s he said that there's too many men that have not gone up to the mountain and had that mountaintop experience like moses had with the fiery bush you know the burning bush and got a message and went down they have borrowed the fire of others and we we've got to be very careful about doing that because every one of us especially if you're called to the fivefold ministry you have a unique calling from God. Don't taint it with success or whatever that other people have. There's, there, there, there is a, a grave responsibility. The, the anointing comes from Jesus, okay? It, it's not, you, you can't share the anointing of somebody else and somebody else. And so there, I, I do not believe in apostolic secession. And that, that goes back to the mystery religions and the Catholic Church borrowed it. But I believe that every one of us, we, we have got to get that anointing from Jesus. And then that anointing uh, is amplified when it goes through a sanctified soul. And see, that the, 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 the emphasis is a sanctified soul. And there will be a uniqueness to it. The Elijah anointing was different than Elisha's anointing, which was different than Jeremiah's anointing, which was different than Isaiah's anointing. There was a similarity because it came from the Holy Spirit. But it had to flow through flawed vessels that were working on sanctification. And when we, when we realize that, I, I can't run off to somebody else and try to, to, to try to borrow whatever they're doing because I don't know, number one, their level of sanctification. I don't know if they're using worldly ways, and a lot of the uh, mega church movement is based on New Age and entertainment and so many other things, rather than centered around the preaching of the Word. Mm-hmm. And so, guys, it's, I, I think we're, we're in a time that we're going to have to strip everything back down to the Word of God. That if it doesn't line up with the full counsel of Word going from Genesis to Revelation, if we can't see Jesus doing it, if we can't see Peter doing it, if we can't see Paul doing it, then why in the world 
are we doing it? Well, it always concerns me when I've seen clips of Paul Kane laying hands on people and speaking things over them, and I'm thinking, well, um, he had the problem with homosexuality, and so, you know, it, it, is it the double stream? Do you or do you think that that was ever? Paul Kane is the one that I have a real big question mark with. You know, I, I remember that there there are certain men of God that I've been in the room with. Okay. I was in the room with Lester Summerall up in St. Louis. I thought my head was going to explode. I mean, the the anointing was so strong. I mean, it burned in me. The whole time he was preaching I had and, and, and speaking, I had tears rolling down my face. I could hardly contain it. It was that strong. I sat in a room with Paul Kane, and it was it was a dead needle. There was nothing. I thought I thought I was in a in a room with a, with a soothsayer. Well, demons can tell you information about people. Oh yeah. You know, they got a network to where, especially if somebody's uh, got doors open and there are spirits present that are affecting them, it wouldn't be hard for those spirits to just project and give somebody, you know, they could read their mail all over the place. And I'm not saying that that's not real, that that, that God couldn't use something like that to... Um, but there would to have help to be a greater like kingdom to, purpose behind right, it. Right, like like maybe to change somebody's life or something like that. But just sitting up there and saying, you live here, and you, I mean, a spirit can do that. And so, and I, I wonder just how much is, is visible in the second heaven, if you can see there. Uh, because those things don't impress me for this reason. The Dalai Lama can do it. That uh, Blavatsky could do it. Mm-hmm. That... Uh, I have read documentation about rabbis that were deep into Kabbalah, which is the mystery religions, that they that you would walk in a room and they would know everything about your character and everything about you. You see, that doesn't impress me. What impresses me is when they bring you to a kingdom moment where there's a transformation that goes on that brings greater kingdom purpose. Because the enemy can do, you know, I, I think that we have, without realizing it, have allowed Janice and Jambres to operate yeah. in, in the church. That's what I'm and called of. ministry. Mm-hmm. And and so you've got people like that that are trusted. And I I'm I just feel in my spirit so deeply that that we've got to have firm foundations in the word reestablished because yeah. it just it can get mm. off so easily. I would rather have no signs and wonders in the preaching of the word than false. Than false. <laughs> yeah, me too. And and I um, really love. I I know in my heart that God wants to show Himself so powerful yes. and heal and things. I know it, and I. But I've He been, wants a pure stream. Yeah, because otherwise it's just it becomes a mess. Yeah, you know, even the reformers and and I, I actually used this on the the logo when we were Evangelical Theological Seminary, Testimonium Spiritus Sancti, which is which is Latin for. The, the spirit testifies of the word. But there's a greater truth here. The reformers understood that if you have all word and no spirit of God, you end up in legalism. And how many churches have we seen end up in real legalism? But if you have all spirit and no word, you end up in mysticism. That there, there is a balance. And I, I think the 80-20 principle uh, is the right balance. 80% word, 20% signs and wonders. Because otherwise, we, we kick, people come to be entertained and rather than to hear the word. But the signs and wonders, when you go back to Mark, the very last chapter, it says, God confirmed the word with signs and wonders. Mm-hmm. The signs and wonders should be a confirmation right. of, of Christ and him crucified being preached. Mm-hmm. If that isn't being done then the signs and wonders are to get you off because you'll start following signs and wonders. Mm-hmm. Especially if their lifestyle doesn't line up with the Word of God. That's exactly what Moses warned them. He said, listen, if everything they said came to pass, but they lead you another way except what's in the written Word of God, I was testing you to see if you love signs and wonders more than me. Mm. And right now the church has failed that test, Mary. Well, um, one of the things God spoke to me this last week was that uh, his people are in disarray, and you know there's several definitions for that. But what jumped out to me was lack of order and confusion. And boy, that that uh, 
really describes a lot of, of what we've seen. Well, and the Bible says where there's confusion, there's every evil work. Um, he took me to Ezekiel 12, 2. It says, Son of man, thou dwellest in the midst of a rebellious house, which have eyes to see and see not. They have ears to hear and hear not, for they are a rebellious house. And we were talking about that. You said that the um, Jesus used that same thing to describe the Pharisees. And so what, what we've got today is a religious system. And um, I thought it, it t- takes us to the church of Laodicea. Because it says, uh, because thou sayest, I am rich and increased with goods and have need of nothing, and knowest not that thou art wretched, miserable, and poor, and blind, and naked, I counsel thee to buy of me gold tried in the fire, that thou mayest be rich in white raiment, that thou may, mayest be clothed, and that the shame of thy nakedness do not appear, and anoint thine eyes with eyes said, that thou mayest see. Um, and so I wanted to... I just was kind of putting some things together in my mind, and I went to, uh, I mean, these are things that we've got to be praying about because the remnant in the middle of a rebellious house is going to have a rough old way to go. (laughs) And so um, I went to Jeremiah 17. It says, Thus saith the Lord, Cursed be the man that trusteth in man, and maketh flesh his arm, and whose heart departeth from the Lord. For he shall be... Like the heath in the desert, and shall not see when good cometh, but shall inhabit the parched places in the wilderness, in a salt land, and not inhabited. Blessed is the man that trusteth in the Lord, and whose hope the Lord is. For he shall be as a tree planted by the waters, and that spreadeth out her roots by the river, and shall not see when heat cometh. But her leaf shall be green, and shall not be careful in the year of drought, neither shall cease from yielding fruit." And we've got to have the cleansing of the water of the word because you can directly tie it to that. That that that's if if the water's there, if if you're planted by a water source, then no matter if the heat comes, no matter what's going on, you're going to be okay, and you yes. can yield fruit. Because that's what I feel like like. Satan's got us in a position to where, and I, and I know there are exceptions, but for the most part. I just look out and and I at a lot of the services and a lot of the things we've witnessed and I just think this is a circus. No wonder God's saying we're in disarray. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. And so God's got to bring the remnant out, but but the remnant's got to be established <clears throat> in the Word of God, and that's what I'm hoping that, that I was I feeling like God was going to um, give you an anointing to lay that out. I think we I think we're at the place where we have goats in the kingdom because they they uh, received a watered down gospel that did not produce repentance and conversion. And we also I mean we're having a religion that's being preached that is repentless. And I, I was looking this morning and I could I, I remember the quote, I just can't remember the source. It was either Spurgeon or John Owen. It's one or the other, that he said, a proud man will resist the call to repentance. But a humble man walking in righteousness, the very idea that sin might be somewhere in his life will bring him to knees, bring him to his knees in tears. And right now we have a church that resists true repentance well, true. because we're lifted up in pride. Well, and in when it's describing the church of Laodicea, it says, uh, anoint thine eyes with thy sad, that thou mayest see. That's got to be our, our prayer. That we yes. can be able to see because a lot of what, why we're, I think, in disarray is because there's so much that's going on that people don't even understand. Even in, in the nation, even in the nations of the world, there's so much that's been hidden, so many agendas that the kingdom of darkness has just brought to fruition. Uh, we're really in a catch-up state here to try to, to pray that they aren't brought all the way because if they're brought all the way to what they want, there's not going to be anything but slavery. Yes. And we're already in a, have been in a form of slavery for decades. But, I mean, they want to take it all the way to where everybody's going to well know they're in slavery. That's why they don't want you to own anything, be able to not accumulate any wealth or anything else, except for the elite that are billionaires. They, they want us serfs in the system to where we don't own anything. Mm-hmm. And we the very bread that we put in our mouths every day, we owe to some overlord somewhere or some system, and that doesn't work. I mean, that's, that's basically how they um, 
domesticated the American Indian is, is the word that they use. And the, actually, our welfare system is based off that same thing, that once you get into the welfare system, it's there to keep you under. Regardless of what they say, they're, oh, we're helping people. But, you know, the minute that they try to get out and they try to improve themselves, they cut off their support. So that you're trapped in the system unless you have an outside ch- source like the church that will say, listen, we're going to come in and we're going to help you get what you need to, to get out of the system. I know that uh, Dr. Jerry Kaufman up in, up in New York, they, they ran into that. And they actually had, I mean, they uh, some of the basic things, you know, not only teaching the word, Mary, but they had women that would give these young women classes on this is how you actually cook food so that you can get, you know, a big bag of beans, a bunch of rice and, you know, all these things, and you can make it stretch so that you're not living off this, off this very expensive junk food all the time, which keeps you in the welfare system. And, and they actually helped these women slowly get to the place where they were no longer dependent in the system. I remember uh, meeting one woman, and, and she had such a sweet spirit. But as a teenager, she had gotten into drugs and prostitution and stuff, this ministry, their ministry stepped in and helped her, turned her life around. She not only graduated high school, she did so well that she got a scholarship to college, and she was now the attorney serving the ministry. Boy, that's, that's, see, worth that's that, yeah. You see, there, there should be transformation like yeah. that going on. And if you've got that foundation, that's the kind of fruit we should see. Yes. And, and the, the whole thing is lives change, families being restored, Bodies being restored. I love to see the supernatural power of God, but I want, I want the real, and not some pseudo thing. Well, and the enemy knows our shortfalls. A lot of times, he's created situations in our life to give us the shortfalls. Yes. And so, there's nothing I think he loves better <clears throat> than to to get us in ministry and and make it look like we do have some miracles or things like that, and then he just pulls that little ticket he's got. And the shortfall that's not been taken care of takes the person down. Well, I think sometimes he could take them down like some of the things that we have seen, you know, kind of come in the national headline. But I also think what he, what he likes to do is if, if I have all these open doors, and, I'm, and I mean, we, we have run into situations to where, you know, it's like when you move in the prophetic, you don't reach up into the ether. That's the second heaven. That's where principalities and powers and as witches can broadcast and everything else. You reach into your spirit, man, because that's where the Holy Spirit is. You reach mm-hmm. in, you don't reach up. And we have, we have so many reach up, and all of a sudden they're beginning to be influenced by, they may have witches in the congregation. They're, they're opening themselves up to other spirits, and people will respond to it. And I've read stories how ministers have fallen trapped to this, that all of a sudden they, they reach up and they get something and it causes a greater offering or it causes people to get really excited and maybe the attendance doubles. And so they're, they're starting to get off and they start, then it slowly starts changing what they teach. And that teaching is then identified with the growth. And if you get big enough, that becomes a trend, and now the next thing you know, you have 100 ministries following after doing exactly what you're doing, teaching the same things. Can you see how the enemy does things? Oh, yeah. He's um, a master strategist, and there's no that's not building him up. That's just saying the truth. He it, is. So, it, he, he is. And we uh, better know it. When, when, you, when you look at it, and I deal with this in several of my books, when you look at what it says about him uh, in, in his creation, he, is a, he, he was perfected in the skill of warfare. And he is very strategic. That's why God is so much more strategic. Uh, I was down at Skywatch TV, and we're dealing with the void earth thing, and I I think there are certain things that God is releasing to the body through a lot of different ministries, you know, calling us to repentance, uh, getting a hold of, of things that take us back to the foundation of the word. If it's truly God, it is strategic, and there's always a long term vision for what he's doing. It's not a you know a flash in the pan kind of thing, but I I have marveled at how strategic God is when it's really God moving, uh, and so it, I I think God is is working to restore truth. But I, I remember when um, back in the nineties when you know I kind of woke up out of the faith movement, and God basically took me back to ground zero. Mm-hmm. And I, and I had to re-examine everything, and it's like, 
uh, whether it was the pre-trib rapture or so many other things that, that, that out of Darbyism that I, that I had to study. And I, I actually, and you, I, mean, I remember when the first thing you did, after one of the first things you did after you got free from your depression and started hearing from God is you were challenging the status quo and saying, Mike, exegete the scriptures yourself. Go back and study yourself. Just don't regurgitate, you know, what everybody else is saying. And so for the first time, I began really just taking apart those scriptures, and I was shocked. I was shocked at saying, how in the world did they get Mm -hmm. this out of these scriptures? I guess from generations of teaching it that way. Generations of teaching it that way. Uh, One of the ones that that will kind of make you take you back when Carl Gollops was here, and we were talking, and there's a, a scripture in the New Testament that says that the Antichrist will appear in the temple of God and proclaim himself to be God. <laughs> that everybody always reads all that in the English and they don't go back to the original Greek. That there, there are several words that are translated temple in the original Greek used by the Apostle Paul. One meant the physical temple mount or the temple. But there was a very specific one that, uh, that Paul used when he said, you're the temple of God. The church is the temple of God. And, and it was a different Greek word, okay? So that there was, a, there was a distinction between the physical temple on the temple mount and the temple of God among his people. When you go back to that verse, Mary, and this has been taught forever in dispensationalism that the Antichrist will set himself up in the temple of God, declaring himself to be God, that it's on the temple mount, and so we're waiting for the temple to be rebuilt I've heard that over and over. (laughs) The only problem is the Greek word the Apostle Paul used was the word he used for the church and the believer being the temple. That makes sense. So he literally said the Antichrist will set himself up in the church, declaring himself to be God. Yeah, because then he can be identified. Uh Uh-oh. Uh-oh. That's why why we're, we're, we're having to go back to foundation. One of the places God took me this morning was Psalms 11, 3 through 7. It says, If the foundations are destroyed, what can the righteous do? The Lord is in his holy temple, and the Lord's throne is in the heaven. His eyes behold, his eyelids test the sons of men. He doesn't stop there, though. The Lord tests the righteous. God's going to test you to see where you really are. All of us. And he, he tests us to see, is this like if, you know, why did God let these false prophets Oh, these guys that got off, why did God let them get so big in the church? He already told us in his word. He said, listen, when, when, the, when these prophets come, these, this is the criteria, and I'm testing you to see if you love signs and wonders more than you love me. And there are several places in, in the word in the, in the New Testament where, the, where we're told some people claim to be apostles, but when they were examined, they were not. There were some people that claimed to be prophets, and they were examined, and they were not. We're not examining anymore, Mary. We're, we're not examining properly the way that we should. And it, and it comes back to the Word. And so you think that's how the, what the Antichrist spirit's using? He is. And I mean, uh, I, I, think that, I think when he comes, and I deal with this in the Shiner Directive, I think that he will come in whatever is 10 times better than an Armani suit, okay? He will, he will uh, physically appearing. The Bible says when Jesus came, there was no comeliness in him that people would desire him. He came as a common man. This guy will, will look like he is an Asgardian or something. I mean, muscular. He will be debonair. Women will swoon over him. Uh, he will know exactly what to say to sway the masses, and, and he will be so sophisticated, it will be mind-boggling, but he can turn into savagery in a heartbeat if you go against him. And so he will be everything the world is looking for. And, he, and his PR people will be slicker than anything Fifth Avenue ever thought about doing. That's one of the reasons why we got, he said, Jesus said, listen, in the, in the last days, and I, I think this is on many different levels, that uh, there'll be there'll be certain false signs and wonders that come that even the very elect could be deceived, and when you look at the original Greek, it means there is a possibility that the elect can be deceived. That's why we got to stay on guard. Whether it's you know UFO showing up and they're saying we go with pamspermia, or this guy shows up 
and he just knows how to say everything, and he has solutions that work that nobody else can figure out. Whatever the situation is, we have got to have discernment, which means we've got to go back to foundations. And I, and one of the things that God just keeps pushing to my, in my spirit is the Apostle Paul said, I don't want to know anything among you except Christ and him crucified. That's got to be the starting point for everybody, is Christ and him crucified. That if I can't see a crucified life, if I can't see this transformation that came by the completed work of Jesus, then we need to go back and go back to square one. I mean, even if it's Jesus loves me, this I know because the Bible tells me. So if we got to go all the way back down to that, and then everything, everything has to line up with Jesus. Jesus is the cornerstone. So that every doctrine, everything we do has to line up with who Jesus is in the Word, his character, and his nature, everything has to line up. And so, I'm, I mean, this, I think God is calling us to a deep dive examination of everything. And it may be hard because, I mean, there's a lot of sacred cows I think God's getting ready to kill. Well, if we can get, if we can get the scriptures straight, like going back, like that's, that's an amazing thing because there's so many people believe so many different that things. Temple, yeah. Um, if we can get those kind of things straight, I think, I think it'll be clearer to people. It shouldn't be this confusing. <laughs> it, it's confusing when 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 we're not properly expounding scripture, but we're taking little bits here, little bits there, little bits over there, and then adding all of our own opinion to it. Now we know there, there are times. That sometimes you have to add your opinion. Like this, this is based upon what I've seen in the Word and what I understand. But you know, it's it's like the um, serpent seed doctrine that came up in the in the eighteen hundreds and and became really popular even after World War II. And you know, when I think serpent seed, I think of the lies of the enemy, and I think of the Nephilim of Genesis six. That's mm-hmm. what I think of. But out of white supremacy. What came and they said, well, you know, the lost tribes of Israel are, are the English-speaking white people of Great Britain and all the, that whole area. And so everybody else, anybody of color, anybody that is, is not Caucasian, uh, they, they made up the lie that the dragon had intimacy with Eve, and that's what produced Cain. That's not in the Word of God. What a crock. Why are you reading that garbage into the Word of God? And it became extremely popular, and it is still in a lot of places today. That is, is still very popular. I can't believe it anybody is believes. not in the Word of God. The Bible said that Eve knew Adam, didn't know anybody else. Okay, and and I look at these things, and I look at how many things we add to Scripture. We add to Scripture. We we create stories that add to. That's eisegesis. That's you're adding to Scripture. And boy, I tell you what, that's, you know, uh, the Torah itself, I mean, has a warning. If you add anything to it, I'm going to add all the curses Mm -hmm. that were pronounced in the Torah on you. Don't add to the Word of God. How about us humble ourselves and go to the Word and say, God, show me truth. Show me truth. I'm not going to add to it. But what you have declared is true, and I'm I'm just going to stay with that. I mean, there there are so many things like that that they have added. I guess it it shows you the level of deception that is with error, that people would follow something that crazy. Yeah, well, I, I think it I think it came out of pride. You know, um, white supremacy was very you know it, it and and so and but you know it's not just white supremacy. We can have in the black community black pride, or we we have an entire movement named pride. The Bible says pride cometh before the fall. You know, I'm, I'm, I, uh, one of the scriptures God took me to in, in Romans chapter 12, verse 3, it says, For I say, though the grace of God given to me to everyone who is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly, as God has dealt with to each man the measure of faith. There, there, the devil does one of two things. He either gets you to where you think more highly of yourself. He lifts you up in pride. Or the the flip side of pride is a false humility that you're nobody that you're a worm. 
And we, we've got to find the balance of who we are in Christ. But guys, our, our modern theology, and, you know, I, I, was, I was talking with some guys yesterday when I was down at Skywatch that I love to go back to the older theologies when you uh, go back in the 1700s, 1800s. I, I mean, I've got the entire works of John Owens I'm working through right now, and it's meat. It's like sometimes you read two or three pages and you got to chew on it for a day or two because there was such depth to it. There was depth there, but the closer we get to the 20th century, the, all of a sudden everything began to be replaced with cotton candy. And it, it is really, really watered down. And so I, I find myself going back to a lot of the older works. And one of the principles of the Reformation is that the Reformation never stops, that, that you must always be in a constant state of reform that there will always be something to correct, there will always be something to repent of, to bring you back to the gold standard of Jesus and the Word of God. And we need to remember that. But you know, as I was looking at, especially much of these things come out of, out of the prosperity of Western society. And it has, it has, you know, we have the world system has creeped in, we have confusion and chaos, we have this, this false pride uh, because we have had such affluence out of like out of Laodicea, it has caused the church to to be left with without transformational salvations. You know, it used to be that you became a different person when you got saved. Now you just change what you do, what you do on the weekend. Okay, the true transformation. If we truly become a new creature, a true salvation, you will have a hunger to learn all about Jesus that you can. And to be more like him every day. Because he's the one that just saved your soul. That's the goal. (laughs) Uh, We become egotistical. We think of ourselves more than we ought. Uh, Like you've already said, we're spiritually weak, blind, and sick. Uh, And we're not clothed in biblical holiness or righteousness, but an artificial pseudo-righteousness created out of wealth and affluence. And this is one of the things that Laodicea warns us about, is that wealth and affluence can mimic spirituality. Well, they got to be a god. Look how big they are. Look at look you know look at all the th- all the things that they have done. Jesus said, "Why call me Lord, Lord, and don't do the things I said?" You know, have we not cast out demons in your name? Have we not done you know? We could go on down the list. Have we not built great churches in your name? Have we not built hospitals in your name? Have we not done all these things? Mary, the last thing I want to hear is, "Depart from me, you worker of iniquity. I never knew you." And I know me a lawlessness. I never knew you. You, had, you knew of me, but you didn't know me. I remember we were watching a, a video of this guy that had a visitation from God, and, and uh, God began to show him, you know, your mom knows of me but doesn't know me, and, and your dad doesn't know me at all. And, and he began to labor to, to win his family to the Lord. And he, you know, with his mom, he said, what do you mean she doesn't know you? She's in church three days a week. She's the pianist at church. And all that. She knows of me, but she doesn't know me. I think we have too many people that know Jesus from afar. But they, they have not sat in the lap of the Savior. They've not, they've, not, they've not actually been with the shepherd. They've seen him afar off on a hill someplace. But that doesn't mean that you have a personal relationship. Jesus is calling us to himself right mm-hmm. now. He really is. You know, come learn of me. Mm-hmm. Know who I am. And I don't care. You can be an, an expert on the Dead Sea Scrolls. And end up in a devil's hell. You can be an expert in Greek and Hebrew and end up in a devil's hell. You know, understanding the Dead Sea Scrolls is useful. Understanding Greek and Hebrew, especially when you're exegeting Scripture, is very helpful. But unless you know Jesus, and that, that's why the Apostle Paul said, listen, you, you can show me all these other things, but unless I can see Christ crucified in your life, we're back to square one. Now, if we can get there, if we can get there, we can do something. Yeah, and guard our minds. Yeah, guard so our that minds. Counterfeits don't try to talk to us. And and God warned me about some things. He said that uh, we cannot move forward until we recognize where we are spiritually. Repent and labor, labor. And I mean, it was it was like there was a. It's going to take work uh, to rebuild the spiritual foundations of faith in our life. We have become increasingly vulnerable to the enemy's machinations, and will continue to decline spiritually 
while at the same time being lifted up in pride, which is exactly what happened with the, with the northern tribes before they were judged. In the southern tribes as well. Both things happen. It's like we have this covenant with God. God would never judge us while they've got idols in the court mm-hmm. of God. They were saying God would never judge us because we're in covenant with him and we know his commandments. They didn't keep any of them, but <laughs> they thought they knew them. And then they were in shock when God judged them. And he went on to say, he said, we can either repent and work to reestablish biblical faith or God will be forced to remove the things of the world that we have trusted in instead of him. I've wondered if it's really a concern of mine because there's so much good that is used through the technology. But I have wondered because of the addiction, addiction. to phones. I mean, you just don't go anywhere that somebody's not and you're lucky if you don't see them driving down the road, a semi-driver looking at their phone. I mean, it's an addiction, Mike. And I've tried to stay. I, I mean, I get with the computer as when I have to because there's no way not to with the ministry. But as far as, like, if you have some personal time, boy, I would suggest taking time away from the phone. I, I think they can use it more than you can imagine. And one of the things that we're finding out about reading You know, and I I use a Kindle because I can, especially with a Kindle scribe, I can make the print bigger to where it's really easy for me to read. But it affects the mind differently. We're we're finding out that, you know, when you you read a page of a book, there is a permanence with that, and your mind understands that. With the flick of of a finger, the text on that screen changes. Your mind registers that, and so there's not a permanence. When, when you read something on electronic advice, for all these people that, you know, they, they, all they do their Bible reading on their phone or whatever, you'll remember 10% of what you read. And that, that's one of the reasons I got a, a large print Bible. Get your Bible out. Begin reading out of it. Get you a good couple of Bible highlighters. I like the pencil ones because I know they won't soak through the page. And, and I've got pens that I can underline and stuff. And, and get ones that have enough room where you can you make it yours. You underline. You can put notes. Uh, Mary puts a lot of sticky notes in hers. Make that yours because when th- there have been times, like when I'm researching and God is showing me things, I will literally see the book and the page and the paragraph that I highlighted, sometimes it had been maybe 10 years ago that I did that. And period, what shocks me is I'll grab the book, I'll open up, and I'll, I'll try to find the page because I'll look for a page that matched what I saw. And it's the page, and I have that sentence highlighted, and I have a note by it, just like what I saw, because your mind registers. Mm-hmm. There's a permanence to that. And I, I just wish that uh, more of the, the, the books that I read were a little bit bigger print. Well, well that's what I've been so concerned with. Will, will God take down the phone towers to save the, the young people? You know, I, I, don't want to be, I don't want to resort to becoming Amish, okay? And, and I mean, this is a serious addiction, Mike. This is, is. This is beyond anything I've seen other than just out-and-out drugs. You know, to where people just can't get off of them. It's it's almost an impossibility to get somebody off of their phone. Well, the the tech giants realized, especially when I, I think Facebook and another platform similar to that were actually built on CIA seed money. They found out that if you get a like, you get that ding, that it releases the same chemicals in your body that addiction does, and so you get this little high. You know, to say that you have, you know, 10,000 friends on, on YouTube. No, you don't. They're not your friends. You, you have no personal relationship with them. Well, I, that's my concern is I think there's, there's a, a pseudo relationship building thing there. Yeah. And I think, it's, I think it allows people to, if they have insecurities in one way or another, it allows them a place to be. And it's like they're, they're taking this to move us toward the, what we've seen where they just make the little cubicles where everybody just stays in there and you get a, uh, you know, your food given to you and everything like that, and then, then you just stay on this Play video device. games all day or whatever. 
Yeah, I mean, don't let it become more than a tool. I mean, there are times, you know, I'll text people because it's a, quicker than a phone call if I need this something like from Mike Spalding or something. But you, you have to be careful not to sit and, and just watch videos all day. I mean, that there's, there's, there, you know, there's a time if you, like, let's say you need to figure out how to build something, you can watch. I mean, there are things useful to that. But there's also just a lot of stupid stuff. You don't need to watch 500 kitten videos, you know. Yeah. Um, but all this becomes addictive, and we, we need to balance it out. It needs to be this 2080 principle again. Well, there's a, a spirit, I believe, that's connected to this, a seductive spirit. Yes. To, make, to get you to where you're addicted. Because I think the enemy can use this beyond what we can imagine. Um, I've even wondered if, you know, there's a lot of men that are addicted to porn because it's, that is easier than trying to actually build a real relationship with, with somebody. And guys, that's straight from the pits of hell. Well, and I think it's, it's being pushed because there's so much trauma. That most people have just gone through trauma. And remember that we saw a movie years ago where the, the people would just um, not live their life. They'd be hooked up to something, and then was it like a virtual reality or, or something that would go for them and but they would go to work and things but they would just the oh, real person was it was just, called surrogates to where you could you could live and, and you had this artificial body that was like a robot that it became and, your avatar and what caused those people in that movie to do that was they they lost a child and so one of the things that i i think we've really got to pray about that god would would help is escapism yeah because if you don't stay in reality, you can't have your eyes open. You won't have eyes to see. And then if people, you know, one of these days, there's something going to show up. And it's going to so alarm people because they haven't watched. They haven't, they don't know what the word says about what's going to happen. I think, I think they're just going to be thrown for such a loop they can't function. How can you be a watcher on the wall if you have your nose glued to a phone? And part of it is, is complete distraction. Mm -hmm. You know, and, and you and I have talked about this. It was, it was interesting during the fall of the Malamar Republic after World War I that um, Germany uh, basically made alcohol free. And they, they had the uh, um, cabarets and different things. It placated the people. And if you're drunk, you don't realize how bad it's getting and, I mean, there were people that were making over a million dollars a day or a million marks or whatever it was a day, and that was barely enough to buy bread for that day that many times they had to let them off an extra time at lunchtime because if they didn't let them go buy their food at lunch for that day, by evening when they get off work, the price of the food would have doubled. And so you you – you you provide, and I think that's the whole push behind marijuana and everything else. Where we're use, they're using technology and other things to distract and anesthetize people, so they don't realize how bad it's really getting. I, I think we're on the on the verge of stag inflation in, in Western society, but they're lying to us about it and well, trying to hide the fact. And they're saying, "Well, no, you know, inflation's at five percent. No, it's been. Oh, well, you know, there, there, Mary, there are a lot of things you and I have seen in the last two or three years that have doubled in price." Well, I know that, that there's, in my opinion anyway, there's, I think there are vast amounts of oil that aren't even discovered yet. We know there are huge amounts in Alaska. There's different places that we have. We could be self-sustaining on that, but they, they keep this connection to Saudi Arabia. Um, but that that's one way that I think that God can miraculously turn things around. But the only way he's going to miraculously turn things around is if people consecrate themselves to him to where he he can trust people with his presence with his anointing with yes. and so um you, you can't get there if you're if you're uh, a rebellious house no you can't you can't get there if you're in disarray and you are out of order and you everyone is confused god is god is a god of order so I we've mean, got to pray some things before we can get to that <laughs> We, we, we have to have this day one principle. You know, you have the earth was in disarray. On the first day, God created light. And he separated the light from the darkness. That's what we need to ask God to do right now in our lives. Father, separate the darkness of the enemy from the light of your kingdom and make it plain yes. so that we can know it. Because he, he 
comes as an angel of light. He pretends. And it's it looks like light. But it's a dark light. Mm-hmm. And it produces dark effects. It does. Guys, God's getting ready to turn the lights on, literally. If we will seek him, he'll show us exactly where we are. And I think there's going to be radical changes to our lives Mm -hmm. that's about to happen. And it can happen one of two ways. Either you can obey God and God does it, which means there may, there'll be certain things you're going to have to put down. There's certain new things you're going to have to pick up. There's, there's life changes that are going to be necessary. And I would rather do it that way. Oh, so much easier. (laughs) Than, than to be forced into the Mm -hmm. state of Amishness. You know what I mean? I, I like I like flesh and potties. <laughs> I, I like having a car that I can drive when I need to do things for the kingdom and do things for my family. Uh, I like being able to do the podcast and stuff. I don't want these things taken away. But I, I think in the end of the day, God is more interested in forging the character of Christ in us than he is in our luxuries. And oh, that, that's, sure, a, that's yes. a hard pill to swallow. I remember for sure. years ago I, I made that statement, and I was actually in a medium security federal prison in Canada preaching to inmates, and I made that statement, and it made them mad because they had been listening to prosperity right. preachers. No, 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 God's interested in me having stuff. Well, no, the stuff that God's interested in is in you. And what, are, what, what did Paul say? He said, we are, we are not predestined to have a bunch of stuff. We are predestined to be conformed into the image of Christ. At the end of the day, that's all that matters. It is. That is all that matters. And so our heart's cry is, Jesus, I want your, I want your fingerprint in me. Mm-hmm. I want your image stamped in me. And I, I, want to be, I want to be hard as iron to the enemy, but I always want to remain pliable in your hands. And we're going to need... The water of the word, we're going to need the oil of the Holy Spirit, and we're going to need to have a season of just really seeking him like never before. I believe it. And Father, we ask today that you would give us grace. Father, without your grace, none of this is possible. Father, it's your your grace that brought us to salvation. It's your grace that makes your word come alive. It's your grace that... um, helped us in situations where we were stuck on stupid and the enemy wanted to kill us, destroy our families, destroy our lives, but your grace was there in that you, and whether we realized it or not, you either grabbed us up by the hand or grabbed us up by the hair in some instances, and you took us over that, that, that obstacle. And Father, right now, we just lay into your grace. And we're like Zerubbabel that says, you know, can this temple be rebuilt? And the answer is, it's not by might, it's not by power, but it's by my spirit, saith the Lord. And our desire is to see the temple of God built within the people of God, that we could, like Zerubbabel, stand in the middle of that completed temple and shout, grace, grace, grace. And so, Father, we call out for your grace today. Thank you for your mercy. We thank you for your mercy, Father. We, we give the Holy Spirit permission Change anything in us that we need to change. Direct our course. Direct our steps. Change. Move us into that new creature that we are in Christ Jesus. Help us put all old things of the world away so that we can move in your kingdom for your purposes. That our greatest desire is that when we meet you face to face, we hear the words, well done, my good and faithful servant. The, la- the, the thing that, Father, that, that has caused holy fear in me is when the Apostle Paul talked about how that we're, one day we're going to stand before you and our works are going to be piled up and those that are wood, hay, and stubble will be burned up. And he said there are going to be some that their lives meant nothing, meant nothing for the kingdom. And God says, well, you still get in, but they have nothing to show. We need to realize, Father, that the lives that we're living now are the very things that forge the crowns that we can throw at the feet of Jesus. And, Father, for every person 
that listens to this podcast, my prayer is when we get to that place, that our hands would be full. And there would be weight to it that we could throw at his feet and say everything that we did that was good in life. It was because it was Christ in us, the hope of glory. That's it. And that it would be a worship to him. It would be a worship to him, Father. Father, we just thank you and we praise you today for your grace and for your presence. Father, make the word come alive like never before. And Father, let us be quick to repent, quick to listen to your spirit, quick to thank the word so that we could be a people that bring glory to your name. In Jesus' name. Stay informed. Tune in to weekly podcasts by Dr. Michael and Mary Lou Lake to keep you informed, inspired, and empowered in the kingdom of God. Tune in to www.kingdomintelligencebriefing.com. That's kingdomintelligencebriefing.com. This video was made possible by our partners worldwide. Please prayerfully consider supporting the ministry that is preparing the remnant for the unfolding of end times prophecy. Send your offerings to Biblical Life, P.O. Box 160, Seymour, Missouri. That's Biblical Life, P.O. Box 160, Seymour, Missouri, 65746-0160. You can also donate online at store.biblical-life.com. That's store.biblical-life.com.